Hey everyone, Scott Jeske here. This week we're going to be taking a look at the cinematography of the new film The Batman and how to achieve the look of the film through lighting and color grading. But before we get into it, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the bell for more content. It would be a huge help to me in continuing this channel. For display purposes in this demo, I've gone ahead and applied a LUT that I created for my DaVinci Resolve Power Grade, which I'll be breaking down at the end of this video. One thing I do want to mention while I am recreating the shots, I don't want my viewers to get hung up on the accuracy of the recreation themselves. The focus here is more on the lighting techniques and color, and unfortunately I don't have Hollywood production designers for my little two bedroom apartment, but as you'll see, I make do. It's just important to note that when you see this sort of staggering orangish red color it's because the yellowish tungsten light is reflecting off of those walls which is also why we're fading into complete black as well because these walls are not as reflective of light as mine are so when you see the shot and you're like that doesn't look like it just remember that we can make adjustments in the grade to match it better but that's really just for the sake of this shot overall you wouldn't want to push too far in your color grade adjustments to replicate that because that's really a set deck thing, not a color or cinematography thing. Now let's talk about this first shot of the Riddler's victim. Technically speaking, this shot was far easier to achieve than the second one. If I had to do it over, I would have tightened up the mask, but I needed to be able to rip it off quickly to examine the shot since I was having my wife help with the flashlight movement. I've heard many interviews where the director Matt Reeves and the DP Greg Fraser talk about how this film needed to evoke the dirty imperfections of lenses that were popular in 70s films. If you see the film, much of it lives just barely on the edge of focus. It's a very gritty yet pretty aesthetic. I obviously don't have lenses from the 70s, but I do have this 50mm T2.9 anamorphic with a 1.6 stretch, so naturally I opted to use that lens. I also shot this in S-Log3 on my Sony FX3 to allow for the most dynamic range. It also helps that my camera has a full frame sensor, which is much closer to the sensor size of the Arri Alexa LF. Now my camera was set to ISO 1600 with my white balance around 3700K if I recall for this shot. I do have a tufted faux leather chair, but it wasn't quite the right texture or color, so I used this footrest and flipped it up, knowing that my subject would be sitting on the floor for the shot. I turned on two background practical lights for a little bit of a warm glow on the back of the chair, and a bit of color contrast similar to the original shot. For lighting, I used a 1.8K, 1 by 2 foot LED panel set to 5500 Kelvin daylight temperature, with a stop of silk diffusion and an egg crate softbox that really helped cut the light. It wasn't pretty, but it got the job done. From here, I sat in place with the mask over my face, and I directed my wife to brush the light of the flashlight from the left side of my head to the back of it. So that's how I shot the first of the two shots. Let's take a look at my second shot, which is a recreation of this shot with Detective Gordon. Okay, so first off, I turned off all the lights in the room. I set my camera and my frame, then turned on the background practical lights that I knew I would be using. Next, I wanted to shape the shadows in the back practical light a bit. As you know, I don't have black wrap currently, so I just used some tin foil and that got the job done. I ended up adjusting this a little bit to get a little more spill onto the wall later. Next, I wanted to figure out both the color temperature and the placement of my key light. One simple trick that I like to use for finding both the cinematic angle of light, but also matching lighting setups from reference images, is to switch on a light bar and hold it above myself until I find the right angle, distance, etc. This is not exact, but it gives you an approximation of where your key light needs to be. It also helps in determining the necessary white balance for the scene, since I'm guesstimating what was used in the original shot from the film. My light bar is 5500 Kelvin, my background lights are 2700, and currently my camera is set to 3300 to keep my key light cool and my background practicals just warm enough. I adjusted the left practical lamp to sit further on my desk to the camera left side of my face just to give a little bit of that orange glow that you see on the left side of Officer Gordon's face. 
So now that I've roughly found my color temperatures, and again, I'm just guesstimating here, and my key light placement, I'm going to turn on one more practical in the back right corner to give the background a little bit of orange splash. What's helpful about starting the practicals this way is that I don't have to adjust them in terms of luminance. I can add more or less light with my key light and do minor tweaks to exposure on the camera. This helps me to create a dark background. It's much easier to add light to a dark canvas than take light away. So it's better to start in the blackness and build from there with the lights that are existing in the scene. Next, I set up my key light, which is a bicolor flexible LED panel. And when I was testing for this shot, I used a much larger panel, but it proved to be cumbersome and difficult to mount overhead of me. I love this panel because it is super light, it's easy to diffuse, and it's easy to cut with flags or black cloth. At this point, I thought that my son had lost my remote, which uh, dials in the color temperature. So at the moment, my key light is too warm. My key light has two layers of silk diffusion, and next I'll adjust the brightness by remote as well as the color temperature. I did a little bit of testing and eventually landed on 5500 Kelvin. In the film, this bluish light is meant to be motivated by the big windows to the exteriors of the city. It's not entirely realistic, but it creates a beautiful color contrast with the background. The background lamp that I was using for the back right corner wasn't specific enough, so I opted to use one of my little battery operated LED RGB lights. I set it to 2700K and pushed it close to the wall to where it made a little hot spot of orange. Just adds a little bit of pop. And now that I have my key light set up to the right color temperature and luminance, it's a matter of adjusting it in the frame and really judging how far to the side of my face it needs to be and how much shadow I need on the other side. I was getting too much reflection off the white door to the right side of my face, so I used a black foam board for negative fill to help mitigate some of that reflective bounce. Next, I used a black flag on the left side of my face to really add shadow opposite camera. Typically adding shadow to the camera side of the face and backlighting the far side creates more depth, but here I'm imitating the original shot in which the key light is likely appropriate to the placement of the ambient window light. I needed a little bit more orange glow pop on the left side of my face to imply another lamp, so I grabbed another RGB LED, I set it to 2700K, and I hung it on the same stand uh, that has my negative fill flag. It's subtle, but it adds just a little bit more color contrast. Uh, the key light is just a little too shadowy for what I'm trying to achieve, so I decided to soften it with one more layer of frosted diffusion. It cut my exposure just a little bit, so I bumped up my shutter from 180th to 150th, especially knowing that I'll be bringing the whole image down in post anyway. I wanna make sure that I'm not underexposing too much. I also ended up bringing the key light a hair closer to me for the final shot. For the actual movie, I'm assuming that though the color combination and intentions behind the lighting are very similar, I would wager based on a few behind the scenes photos that I saw that the key light source would be much larger with something like a four x four or six by six frame of frost in front of the LED panels. And now you can see that the shot here is ready to film. My shot was shot in 1.6 anamorphic, so I'm just gonna change the Y stretch scale values to 64. I'm gonna relock it and then scale it up to closer to that 2.4. Now, in capturing the quote unquote look of a film or the photographic look of a film, you have to remember that every scene is different. Yes, some of the scenes that stand out in our memory might be fully orange or fully red, but if you look at the film shot to shot, um, that's not the case, you know, but overall the things that I noticed are the overall palette is pretty desaturated. The shadows are lifted and the midtones are brought down. The highlights are not overly bright. We tend to have close to the shadows sort of this tealish blue. Um, the shadows themselves are very desaturated and kind of gray, uh, leaving the skin tones somewhat desaturated as well. And then throughout the film, there is sort of this motif in the tungsten lighting of sort of this warmer orangish reddish color. And then also 
the reds are deep and saturated compared to most of the rest of the color palette of the film. And here again, you can see the teals close to the shadows. So I point that out because in doing the color grade, you want to think of the film as a whole, as if you were creating a LUT. You don't want to just think like, oh, well, that one scene was really orange, so the look of the film is orange. That's not really the case. Um, you want to think about what are the colors that I make pop and what are the colors that I bring down in saturation. Okay, so first I'm going to hit Command K to um, create several nodes. And again, I'm also using DaVinci Resolve um, because it just has the most flexibility and is sort of the quickest way to achieve this look. And if you need to, you can export the look as a LUT and bring it into Final Cut or Premiere or whatever you're working with. So first off, I am going to get basically my curves and let's just compare the two shots. Everything's really uh, low between zero and 128. Um, very kind of underexposed and the shadows are slightly lifted you can see here rather than just first attacking the shadows I'm going to apply some curves I want to keep the highlights basically where they are and I'm gonna do starting off just your basic kind of s curve is what it's called because you formed the shape of an s and as you can see I'm bringing everything down closer to the exposure levels of this shot here and we can go even further with it i'm gonna go even further um, sort of the mids i don't want to do too much with this exposure wise because first i really want to get kind of the the gamma curve appropriate to the film which again is sort of lifted shadows darkened midtones don't want to lift the shadows too much but I'm gonna leave the highlights where they are because with the s-log 3 we still have some latitude in the highlights and uh, bring those down if we bring them down any further they're just gonna clip okay now let's bring down our overall Again, we're not gonna get it exact and really more than anything I want it to feel the same it doesn't have to be perfect I like this curve so I'm gonna bring the shadows down just a smidge it's it's pretty close um, again it's not gonna be exactly the same because my entire background is not you know, a dark umber wallpaper um, but yeah, that's looking good. I like the curves. I like the slightly lifted shadows. Next, we're going to go into our primaries or what used to be kind of called your printer lights. So one thing that's actually helpful um, beyond the scopes is this uh, color warper tool um, because I can use the eyedropper and I can, I can very accurately see what colors that I'm looking at so that when I do mine, I can remap the equivalent colors closer to where they are in this frame. I'm just gonna bring my shadows down just a little bit. Okay, so looking at this shot, I'm just gonna add more red into the highlights just for the sake of this shot. Um, to kind of warm it up a little bit in the highlights. And this will be slightly offset by what I do with the midtones, which is bring them a little more towards blue slash cyan. Nothing major, just a little bit to offset it, um, like on his jacket, etc. I think I can bring the shadows just a little yellow brown, just ever so slightly. Okay, and then next, I am going to use the color warper tool, and I am going to bring my blues more towards kind of that teal that I was talking about. So you can see sort of the shadow air, shadowy areas, a little more of a teal and my greens more towards there as well. And I'm going to uh, really bump up that saturation also, make it pop. And then I'm going to get my skin tones here and I'm gonna push them a little more towards yellow further out I bring them, the more saturation I give them, they're just casting a little more yellow. 
And then the other thing to note, just from a lot of the other shots, is that the reds are pretty saturated in this movie. And the reds you would see sort of in the shadow of the ear, where you can kind of see blood. Um, so I'm just going to punch those up a little bit. Get my, um, I'm going to take my reds. Cast them just a teeny bit more towards magenta. We want to see the lampshade get a little closer to the sort of umber color that we see here. You know, it it's, doesn't make sense for the background per se, but just in the spirit of the shot, we want to get it a little bit closer there. Maybe not go too extreme with it though. I'm going to bring up, okay, so we can kind of compare the shots. And it looks like I'm, I'm lacking a little bit in some of that mid-tone teal. So I'm gonna bring mid-tones a little more back towards the cyan. And I think I could give myself a little bit more gain, just ever so slightly in the highlights. Now let's look at the curves and look at hue versus sat. And uh, I am going to just straight up bring up the the sort of red orange saturation a little bit a little more in the red again we're not getting the red that's okay though and now I'm gonna do hue versus hue and I am just going to push that yellow a little more towards uh, towards red and then the last thing is I'm going to get sort of those desaturated shadows. So I am going to do loom versus sat. And I'm going to take the shadow end of the image and desaturate it. And I think we can go a little further into the skin tones even. Okay, there you go. I think that looks pretty darn good. Let's do a little comparison frame. Pretty darn close. Again, I would love to have some of the shadow to work with, but um, you gotta do what you gotta do and you gotta work with what you have. But overall, I would say the look of these looks very similar. So one really cool thing that Greg Fraser did on this film that he actually did on Dune is that he shot it digitally, scanned it to film, and then scanned it back into the computer for the DI. And um, the cool thing that it did there is it added sort of natural grain and gate weave, which if you don't know what gate weave is, it's, it's sort of that jitter where the sprockets on the film um, don't quite catch. And so the film sort of bounces around a little bit. It's very subtle. It's a very big part of the film look. And so just a couple tips on what you can do to really bring the look of this film home is you can add some grain and here i just have a basic overlay grain overlay i got this cool plugin from pixel film studios which is a anamorphic distortion and you can basically soften up the edges and you can give sort of this barrel distortion and you can really control how soft the edges are and again this just adds to that sort of dirty gritty yet pretty look of the film and you can mask that with a 240 frame. And then for gate weave, what I did was I just created in motion the gate weave effect, uh, which was basically just keyframing um, the X and Y values jittering just a little bit and shaking. And so this is what it would look like on a still image. And again, here it is without the anamorphic filter. Here it is with, really just kind of distorts it and dirties it up and gives it a little vignetting with grain without and then my gate weave that I created. And you can find gate weave with a lot of film emulation plugins for either DaVinci or Final Cut Pro, or you can make one in motion or After Effects. So there you have it. That's how I got the look and post of the Batman. As always, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something. And please let me know if you would like to see more of this kind of content. Feel free to sound off in the comments uh, with any thoughts or questions. I'd love to be of assistance in any way that I can. I hope you all have a great rest of the week and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.